let me start without us losing too much time um, on what my talk will be all about for tonight. So I'm going to deal with some of South Africa's impact strategies um, regarding community engagement, in other words, the broader impacts of higher education in society, and that we we do something significant and that we really contribute towards the well-being of society. And so um, what I will be dealing with tonight will just be four main categories. And then I want to still let us do a little bit of an activity. So it's not 8 p.m. in the evening for you. So hopefully you've still got some energy and even the colleagues from the rest of the world where it's later in the evening or uh, late afternoon. We're just gonna do a short bit um, that we would have done and that we're hoping to do when we do a workshop at the, um, at the summit. But what I thought was really relevant is a quote from Mother Teresa where she indicated so many years ago that she cannot change the world, but if she casts a stone on the waters, then many ripples will come. And that's how I see broader impacts. It's that somewhere we make a difference and somewhere it needs to just expand into different levels. And so that's the model also that I will present tonight. So I'll give a little bit of background about the South African context, um, how we are structured. Um, it's very basic. I've attended some of the other webinars with New Zealand and with Leone for the Netherlands. Um, so I'm going to touch a little bit on how it works in South Africa. It's very simplified and yet we are not where we want it to be and I'll indicate that. Then I'm going to touch on the development drivers, so to speak. I'm going to um, indicate by means of example how it works in South Africa with our country plan, our national development plan, um, how it works for the African continent with the African Union, and then, of course, the sustainable development goals, which all of you and all of us are familiar with. Um, then I'm going to show you how one can integrate um, taking a country vision, a country plan, um, like the South African one, and how one can merge that to match what uh, international driver wants, such as the development goals. And it's here at point three that we will do a quick task. We're not going to go into detail, but you can just see how we start planning things. And then I will show you how all of that matures into using a community engagement, i.e. broader impacts model, where one can monitor and evaluate your footprint as a higher education institution. So what is the context of higher education and broader impacts or community engagement in South Africa? Um, for we've got 26 um, higher education institutions in South Africa, of which two are private institutions, the others are public funded, government funded. And somehow, in some way or the other, our institutions have always been involved in some form of trying to make a difference in society. But in a white paper that was released, the legislative paper that was released in 1997 already, and also in our Act for Higher Education of 1997, um, our government then indicated that community engagement together with what one would call tuition or teaching and learning or learning and teaching and research, those three together are the three pillars of higher education. So it's legislated. Our broader impacts are legislated in South Africa for research institutions. So all universities must do all three. We do research, we do, we offer degree programs and we do broader impacts. Some institutions are research led, so they do a lot more research. So they focus a lot more on grad studies, what we call post-grad in South Africa and Africa and others um, are more of a balance, but I'll get to that a bit later. I want to, I've taken two quotes, one I've taken from uh, 1997, when the then Ministry of Higher Education already said that um, community engagement, you know, demonstrates our social responsibility and how as higher education institutions, we must be committed to a common good and make available 
um, infrastructure and people and resources to be of service. And then in 2009, a couple of years later, um, our national plan for higher education emphasized it again, where they said we need to be responsive and we need to align ourselves with regional and national needs. And so yet tonight we are in 2020 and a little bit has happened in South Africa, I'll touch on that, but we're not yet where we've already announced ourselves to be in the late 90s in early millennium. However, as institutions of higher learning, we are really the best place um, because we are knowledge and innovation centers. We are a production plant, so to speak, of it. And so it gives us a perfect opportunity to develop partnerships and to work together with stakeholders to make a difference in society, to improve well-being, um, and then to align ourselves with our national, regional, and, and international strategies. But we don't have a standard against which we can do it yet. So we've only sort of, since 2012, when it was legislated to say all universities must do it since the 1997 Act, um, there has been some help with funding, and I'll show a bit of that now. But we still don't have something like OECD, who's done a global assessment of universities and how they do broader impacts. Um, we are busy with a process where we've applied for funding, um, where we're going to see if we can collaborate with OECD to also do some African universities and see what the broader impacts are like. So what is the context like in South Africa? We have in public sector, we have the Ministry of Science and Innovation. Um, if you Google it, you might find that it used to be called, um, up until three years, or two years ago, it used to be called um, the Science and Technology Department. But when we merged with our new political dispensation, um, some of the ministries, we merged science and technology with higher education and it became science and innovation. So what does this department do? It seeks to boost socioeconomic development to enhance well-being. And it does that by means of making available funding, capacity building, human resources and centers through which one can do it. So that's sort of our government legislative component. Then we have in South Africa research councils, um, the Agricultural Research Council, um, the Science Research Council, the Human Science and the Medical Research Council. So these research councils are what we call parastatals. They semi-public funded, government funded, and the rest they do through, through private research. And then last but not least, um, we have one big entity. So sometimes in the research councils, they make available small grants um, where they would do what we call top up fundings for broader impact research. But for us to do research on broader impacts or community engagement, our best vehicle is through um, our National Research uh, Foundation. And it falls under a specific leg at the end of the presentation. I've given you direct links for those of you who want to look into it. Um, it falls directly under the KFD, the Knowledge Fields Development Fund. And so in that category, we have a special fund six years ago that's specifically for community engagement, for broader impacts. But what has changed also four years ago is that our National Research Foundation whatever fund you apply for, you have to show how it links to broader impacts nationally, regionally and internationally to just be considered. So that's one aspect to try and get us all to start thinking around that topic. Um, but then we have under KFD a specific fund just for community engagement. And it's normally a fund where they give you a grant for three years um, to do the research, and in that you can have grad students and community members. So just to touch a little bit for those of us who are not from South Africa, um, on our Vision 2030 National Development Plan for South Africa, it's a 15-year strategic plan. So Vision 2030 came 
into play exactly the same time when the sustainable development goals. But if you, those of you who work over the, in the rest of Africa, you would see over the past several decades, all African countries has a document called Vision Something. So it's normally a 15 or a 10 year plan and it has those dates. So South Africa has a 15 year one started um, and so it's Vision 2030. The plan has got 15 chapters. I'll show you a little bit about it later on. Um, where it's all about, as a country, how we want to make a difference and achieve well-being in South Africa. And then each chapter represents a specific focus area, which I'll also show in the next few slides. Then we have the continent plan, um, the African Union Agenda or Vision 2063. So you can see that's a much longer plan for the continent. And so why it's got such a late date is because all the African countries doesn't have the same date for their development plans. And so it has to come in all collectively. And of course, it is in 2063, the African Union will also celebrate its 100 years of existence. So again, um, Agenda 63 was launched in 2013. And it's got different decade plans and its first um, 10 year plan, which will come to an end in 2023, is where they looked at how do we look at commonality between what the continent wants and what the sustainable development goals wants. And so I'll show you a match. If you read up on agenda 2063, there's a beautiful table done to match each sustainable development goal with each of the different indicators for Agenda 2063. And then, of course, we are all familiar with the Sustainable Development Goals, where we know there are 17 goals, there's 169 targets that we want to work towards, and of course, we want to measure it using 230 indicators, which are sometimes so overwhelming that most of us just say, yes, we know about the goals, but we're not too sure. And Hopefully tonight's presentation will show us how to start small, but how we can start maneuvering some of the alignment like we've done in South Africa. So all the targets um, that are provided, so 159 targets, gives us as higher education institution an opportunity to form strategic partnerships with our communities. And communities here meaning different communities. It can be communities of scholarship, it can be communities of regional place and space, but it gives us that opportunity because as higher education institutions, our reach is vast and broad through our research and through our students' um, components. So the targets that we can use as an institution linked to the sustainable development goals can actually, it can help us. It can help us to work towards broader impacts um, by community engagement to improve well-being. And so I'll show a model um, on how one can do it. So if we look at our national development plan, if we summarize it, and this might um, project a bit small on your screen, if we summarize Vision 2030, then in essence, it's about prosperity and equity. And how do we want to achieve it? We want to create jobs. And so if you listen carefully, you'll see mm, there's a lot of similarity here between what we know of the sustainable development goals and the South African plan. And so the aim is job creation. Um, the aim is to do better infrastructure for South Africa, to use our resources better, um, our infrastructural resources, to be more inclusive to bring in more the voice of society, just like we've learned from the Millennium Development Goals to Sustainable Development Goals, that there wasn't enough participation of our people on the ground. We want quality education at all levels from um, kindergarten right through to, to university. We want a better healthcare system. We want to build a capable state um, so it's more competent, less corruption, et cetera. We want to fight corruption and we want to make sure that we unite as a nation. So that's the national development plan. So let's see what happens if we merge it with the sustainable development goals. 
So all of a sudden, when we look at the sustainable development goals, we see, hmm, yes, health, gender equity, education, um, inclusive society, a better um, non-corrupt government, balance with the environment, all three year has to do with that, more infrastructure, economic growth, better energy, better resources, etc. So when we do these two, although this one looks very simplistic, we can merge it quite well when we go with the sustainable development goals. So let's take a more closer look at taking our chapters. Now you don't have a, a, a document, you don't have a copy of the South African National Development Plan, because we're just going to do this as a quick fix tonight. But if you download a copy for yourself and you look at the different chapters, and you see all the chapters of the community um, plan for South Africa, and we take each one of the different sustainable development goals, then we can see, right, um, no poverty matches with what we want to achieve in our plan in South Africa in chapter one, seven and nine. So this is a basic, it's more graphic, but it's a basic plotting exercise that you can do by taking any country plan and say, let's match it with the sustainable development goals. The same then if you download um, the African Union vision 2063, where they've done it in a table to show how Vision 2063 plots with the different sustainable development goals. So it's not rocket science to just take each one of these goals and say, how does it match with where I am at in my own country and in my own society? So here comes the activity. I hope each one of you have got a piece of paper if you're still old school, or if you're there in the virtual world, just pop up a notepad for yourself. And then quickly just dot down for me the following. You think of your own environment, your own work environment, whether you are in higher education, whether you are in a research institution, whether you are in government, in the public sector, or just in society in general. Think at where you are and just quickly just dot down for me um, the relevant divisions or departments or faculties or schools in your work environment where you are or if you're in a community in your community organization and just dot down which of those are relevant for you that you can link to development. So if we go back to the sustainable development goals, can you identify any of these that's of significance or relevance? So if I take my own environment and I say, right, I'm from a higher education institution in the Western Cape at the University of the Western Cape, uh, we have faculty members that does research on Sustainable Development Goal number six, which has to do with clean water and sanitation. We have people that does research on food security. We have people that does research on clean energy, so on climate action, number 13. We have people who work on marine life, so number 14. We have people on rural development and land redistribution, so number 15. So if I just quickly think of where I'm at, where I'm employed or where I go about my daily life, let's think about who do I know, or which department or division or center do I know that touches on any one of or many of these goals. And so once you've dotted that down, the next step is now think about an initiative that you can contribute in a particular community or sector. So I've given an example of at UWC, there's so many different topics that people do research on. But if I bring it closer to my own background as a sociologist, I can think back and say, right, maybe I can do something about socioeconomic development. Or maybe I'm from peer science or from public health, and I can say, yes, let's do something about maternal health or Maybe I'm from women's studies and I can do something about gender equity. So just quick, quick dot down on a piece of paper, 
Is there an initiative that I can think of just off the cuff that I can contribute to a community? And once I've done that, let's revisit the sustainable development goals and say this initiative of nine, that's maybe youth empowerment, which one of the different sustainable development goals would I be able to touch on? Which one of the ones that I've showed? Some, maybe just one or two, maybe one will carry more weight than another. But dot it down, think about it carefully and say, why do I think that my initiative will align with a specific sustainable development goal or two? And then think about your own country programs or your own states, like it works in the USA, which one of your country programs objectives will fit best with your program? And you might take it right back to county level in the United States, but just think if you know about something in your own area, maybe yeah, you bring it right home to where you live and where you are from and say, do I know of an initiative in my province or my region or my county that also works towards maybe youth empowerment or uh, maternal health? And then when I'm done with all of that, then jot down, how do I think I would be able to measure these activities? So if I now get going and I start making a change, how will I monitor it? How would I be able to say, what's my progress? And how will I be able to say that I make a difference and to what extent did I make a difference? Not according to my own opinion, but according to critical indicators that I can measure. So let me pause there and see if there's, I'll have to use you, Kevin, or maybe even Mary Beth, because when I present, I can't see all the blue hands going up. But is there anybody that would like to share? Maybe one of you did dot down something, a program or initiative, um, or was this a crash course and you say, no, 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 I'm still struggling to find out what the previous slide showed with all the SDG goals. Is there any hands going up or did you not think you're going to work in tonight's webinar? They say in the virtual world silence is good. So let's give it a few more minutes and then I can show you how it can be done. Is there anybody who wants to share? Yes, Robert, you've raised your hand. Hi, good evening. Thank you for sharing this with us. Um, I have worked in um, KwaZulu-Natal uh, with Steve Johnson uh, and also in the Cape. The, the photo behind me is, uh, is Namakwa National Park. I see um, that. It's beautiful. <laughs> thank you. Um, uh, but getting to the point, um, I, uh, your exercise has made me think about how important it is to communicate with our collaborators. Um, it's, there are limits to which I, as, a, you know, as an American citizen, can never really understand which of these goals is most appropriate, especially if we're doing explore, in exploratory or discovery-based research on sure. pollination biology and whatever. So um, I guess my question for you is, I, I could easily identify things related to my research that might benefit South African conservation of biological resources or education mm -hmm. to the public um, especially in rural places where people live with biodiversity but may not know what's most important about the surrounding areas in terms of endemic species. Um, sure. But I guess my, my question to you is um, how, how well can anybody from outside the country really kind of make, make the case um, for something like that uh, rather than kind of deferring to, your, to, to our collaborators in country? It's a good question and thanks for that. Um, it's easy to say I'm from the University of the Western Cape. My email is there, please phone me. <laughs> but there's also another way of doing it. If you um, go to the National Research Foundation um, website, and again, on my last slide, you will see I've done direct links, but you can also Google it. And what our National Research Foundation has done over the last couple of years is to not just fund 
countries, you know, South African country projects. There's ways to actually do what we call bilaterals, joint research bilaterals. And so we have a wonderful one with, I don't know if you are familiar with BRICS, the BRICS program in the United States that links a lot with, with China, et cetera. Then we have, um, we have a perfectly sound for a couple of years already, um, a joint venture for the National Research Foundation with the Netherlands, um, with Germany. And then three years ago in 2017, there was an initiative launched through the US Embassy and again, the Ministry of Technology and Innovation in South Africa to set up a database for all research in a centers and then of course all universities in the United States and South Africa to be on the on that database through which you can then plug in and start doing um, collective partnerships. The database is not completed yet but the first call for um, collaborative research and partnerships has gone out beginning of last year um, and we've had lovely initiatives that we were approached by different entities in the States and in South Africa um, with more than one university also. So I think the best point to start is to look on the National Research Foundation page, but then also for yourself being from the United States to then also look on this new, the new database. Because it's like you said, the most important thing is for us to be able to reach out and to connect. But it doesn't help I have a willingness to do so and I don't know which contact. And so what we've also done in South Africa, um, quite a few years ago, we put together um, SAHESIF, which is the South African Forum for Community Engagement for Universities, for higher education institutions. And that's just where we realized that as the 26 universities in South Africa, we don't actually even know what we are all up to, so to speak. And so we're using that, but it's still, it's taking us quite a bit of time because we never had direct funding to do it. So it was all voluntary, et cetera. Um, again, that's details that you can, you're more than welcome to even email me on or um, send me a, a text message and I can bring you in touch with more people. Um, but I think your best one to go country specific and that can take you into Africa and into some of the islands like Madagascar, et cetera, and the Philippines also um, linked to the National Research Foundation, um, for sure. Um, you've just mentioned briefly what you do, but there's also huge collaboration with um, with Namibia, which is the old Southwest Africa because of um, the fauna and flora and from your virtual background. So please do make contact. And if you don't come right via the National Research Foundation or the US database, then let me know. Okay, is there anybody else who's got a pressing issue before we just do the last few slides and then there should be time for questions. Okay, you're off the hook for telling me how you've answered your five points of thought. And so if I look at answering this and I now say, let's make it in a diagram or let's put it in a broader impacts model. Then let's start with broader impacts now thinking national plan, Africa continent plan, international global um, drivers like sustainable development goals. And so when I look at those and I put it in levels, then I look at micro, meso, and macro. But if I think back now, sustainable development goals, and I think back about the diagram that I've showed for my own country plan, and I think back about what OECD uses as global indicators for well-being, which so many countries belong to that because we all send in through our Auditor generals, our country um, statistics for it. Then I know David Skitter, one of my mentors from many years ago, started with something like this, and then I carried on with my own research in it, where we said, What is it that man needed from the beginning of time 
and will always meet. Doesn't matter how advanced we are as a society. There was always since the beginning of time some form of healthy. Whether it was just my elders who mix their own herbs and medicine, and if you think about it, we're going back to it with all our natural health medicines, etc. There was always some form of transport, even if it was by foot. Or then we invented the wheel, and nowadays we're thinking of flying in, out of space. We always had a form of income, whether we barter or exchange different things. So there was always some microcosmo economy going on. There was always some form of energy, whether it was fire or whether it's now nuclear energy or natural environmental green energy, there was always that. And so we can go through all of these indicators and say, it's always some form of communication, some form of shelter, some form of food. We always had some form of recreation where we socialize and have fun. Even this year in COVID, we started socializing through the virtual world. I see there's now Santos that sends messages through the virtual world. And so we've adapted quite fast. So if I take these different indicators and I say, let's go to my meso exo level, Let's see if I can cluster it. There's always an economy cluster because remember we're looking at social economic well-being. So there's always an economy cluster, there's always a social cluster, and we need infrastructure to do it. So no matter whether you look at Vision 2030, African Union Plan or Sustainable Development Goals, you see all those clusters, all those goals can be clustered in those three clusters. And so when I take it to macro level, then I say, right, how does it translate into the sustainable development goals? So in conclusion, after you've had a crash view, not even a crash webinar on a broader impacts process in South Africa, what do we need to take home from tonight's brief discussion? We have a social responsibility um, and we need to do our civic engagement whether we are a research institution, whether we are a higher education institution, there's the social responsibility as a citizen, but also as somebody in education or in research to engage. Um, and just like Robert mentioned earlier, it's so important to connect with stakeholders. And remember our society, our community members, our citizens are the most important stakeholders because not only have they got a stake in it, they're the beneficiary, they're the target group. And so it's important that we keep in mind our responsibility and that we, it should reflect in all our strategic decisions. This is a loaded paragraph. There's a lot of things around ethics and broader impact principles, et cetera, um, that we're currently grappling with also to write a chapter in a book um, that Susan is also leading um, on that, but that we, we keep this in mind because it also doesn't mean that all research is good. Um, with everything that has an impact, there's a positive and a negative. And so I have to juggle, I have to juggle between cutting my losses and having a best possible um, impact. And then lastly, our broader impacts, our engagement must be professional. It cannot be just the five points that I made you think of, dot down on a piece of paper and then move on. It has to start with getting my own thoughts going, then I connect. And so just like the stone that's cast on the water and the ripple effect goes, I must, once I thought about this, find my next circle of people, my next circle of people and get their opinion and input in so that it becomes knowledge driven, it becomes beneficial for society, and that I do research that is significant, that makes a change. So if I look at the qualities of seaweed under a microscope, there must be something that my results can do to bring about change to society, whether it's medicinal or whatever the reason might, might be. This is the page that I've indicated. They are all um, live links for you. So please feel free to connect to some of those links. This is the one for the Research Foundation. 
um, but do also go to the homepage, not just to the KFD fund sector, where you can find all the different joint bilaterals. Um, there's one uh, in those, if you click on it, it will tell you all the different countries and entities in that country. Um, there are some that are multi-country um, uh, joint ventures. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is all from my side. So I'll wait for you to fire away for any questions or comments. Thank you very much. I see two participants raise their hands. So I'm going to stop sharing so that I can see who's raising their hands. Then it's a bit easier. Um, I don't know who raised their hand first, but let's stop. Oh, there's now many more hands. So I see a hand from Robert, um, Kevin. So you can all see each other's hands. Let's not make a gender equality. Whoever wants to go first, please just unmute and fire away. Well, uh, thank you, Dr. Howard. I'm Zoyeu. Yes, Mr. Um, Hewu. I'm glad government has joined in for the evening. You are most welcome. <laughs> thank you. Thank you for, for the benefit of the participants who might not know uh, us here. Uh, I'm working for the Department of Social Development in the province of the Western Cape in South Africa, based in Cape Town, where the University of, uh, of the Western Cape is. Uh, I just am raising to thank uh, Dr. Hart for extending an invitation to government so that as government, we can understand what the, the high education institutions are doing, not only in the Western Cape or in Cape Town, but in the rest of the country, in the region, and in globally. Because I see participants are from all over the world, yeah? which actually makes us to feel very proud to, to have an opportunity to understand what is the thinking around community engagement, in not only in Africa, but in, in, in the rest of the world. And we really see as the Department of Social Development that community engagement is a very important element that needs to be emphasized because gone are the days when government must do the, 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 the things as the government has planned. Government needs to respond and be responsive to the needs of the people. So engagement that leaves are giving us the necessary tools so that we can actually go out there and understand what is it that the communities and voters and citizens feel, what are their urgent priorities, how can those priorities be prioritized in responding to the resources that government has. So mm -hmm. I'm saying thank you so much for the invitation. That's all I have to say, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hewell, and I hope if it's not too much to ask that you can maybe even in the chat box uh, maybe share some details even of government. I know specifically in the Western Cape how your own department also have got international partners. Um, and so I know they are even partners with um, Wisconsin, et cetera. So maybe if you can just share, I don't know if it would be Debbie or yourself as the chief director, but uh, a point or any of you can maybe um, on the webinar that's interested in making contact or knowing more about uh, partnerships or possible initiatives, um, please feel free to do so because I, uh, this is why I've extended the invitation. I see Dr. Paramol Benedet has also joined. She's based in KZN and also through national government um, and also representing the broader part of society. So hopefully with everybody that I've invited, you can even walk away tonight with some contact details or some idea of, of taking things further. So I see Lihoni, your hands on, Kevin, your hands up. Um, who else? I haven't even scrolled down, but please just go ahead and... I'm last in row. <laughs> Thanks, Lihoni. Let's hear I just raised from the others. <laughs> I'll go with my question. Um, Good, I'm, yes. I'm, I'm Jory Weintraub, and uh, I'm part of the ARIS leadership team, um, and I'm also at Duke University. And I want to first thank you for your talk and for sharing all this information with us. Um, I, I just am curious um, to hear from your perspective if 
there have been any big changes in the way the process has been working for you since the pandemic started? Has that impacted priorities or strategies at all, or is it sort of business as usual? Um, it's totally not business as usual. Um, and I think one of the things, and again, um, Mr. Evo and I worked, um, we chatted quite often during um, our higher lockdown levels when our entire country was shut down with nobody out, nobody, no business trading. Um, what, not only have, did we have to change, if you look at our um, national development plan and you even look at the African Union plan, it was much later towards 2030 and for the African Union plan much later towards 2063 in the last decade where we start looking at um, infrastructure for internet, et cetera. Those of you who said that you've worked in South Africa, you would know that what we call an internet connectivity is something quite different from what you experienced. And so not only did our infrastructure not cope, um, we didn't have speed, we didn't have uh, bandwidth, I mean, up until two and a half years ago, we didn't have fiber in South Africa. And so all of a sudden, um, there's no notice. We go into a pandemic. Institutions of higher learning needs to continue teaching, for example. We have students that doesn't have cell phone reception, mobile reception. They don't have devices. So all of that happens just from a higher learning perspective. Government, on the other hand, um, what the pandemic showed is that we actually had, I would say, smokes and mirrors to how we've really attended to well-being in society and how much we really do something towards equity and bringing everybody into a state of well-being in society. I mean, you are all, I'm sure, familiar with our apartheid history. And although we thought we were more than two decades in it and we've done so many initiatives, etc., this pandemic actually showed that there's a much bigger divide between affluent and poor. And so instead of, um, I think, as affluent people in society, um, they've only come to realize that we are all mortal and that money can't buy everything. But I think our poor communities um, suffered the most. And so we started re-looking um, at things. And I will not be surprised um, if our national development plan, Vision 26, 2030 is gonna be revisited for rollout. Um, our national development plan runs in the Department of Planning, Monitoring and Evaluation. We have a department like that at national level. It's based in the office of the presidency of um, President Cyril Ramaphosa. And they monitor, they track how well we, we progressed. But just from reflecting what, what's been in our face from this pandemic, we're going to have to relook even something as basic as our plan for, for 2030. So yes, um, I must commend government for how quickly they released funds to up infrastructure, how people just gone out of their way. But again, for that to happen in a developmental society, it meant as a country, we had to go into more debt. We had to borrow more money. Um, and yet we had an economy that was shut down. And we busy looking at a few spikers coming up, maybe of a second wave of COVID, et cetera, because remember, we've only just come out of our first winter. Um, and so we're just into spring towards summer now. So we, in effect, a little bit behind the rest of the world with the COVID virus. Um, and yet we had an economy that was brought to a standstill. And at the same time, we had to borrow money. And it wasn't just borrowing money to survive and to have medical infrastructure and put up field hospitals in tents in communities. It was also to... Um, to provide welfare and grants to tick over and to do food parcels. Mr. Ewell would be able to tell you with his team how they worked till in the middle of the night, day and night, to just get food to people. Um, we have a lot of children who gets 
food at school. It's their only meal. Um, and so they only get it five days a week, but it was something they used to have. And in the first level of lockdown, there was none of that. Um, and so as a country, we, we were not prepared for it. And yet we survived it. And I think as a nation, it brought us closer together. But there's a long road together specifically. Let's revisit something like our um, Vision 2030. Yeah, thank you for that. Uh, um, it sounds very similar to the way it's been here in the States, except for the last statement you made about bringing us closer together as a nation. I think we've gone in the opposite direction sadly <laughs> in this country. So, yeah. um, but hopefully that will be changing in, yes. in the future. Thank you very much. Thanks, thanks, Julie. Um, Leone, I only Sorry. see your hand. Or oh, was there another yeah. hand that I missed lower down? Yeah, I, I, think I lowered lower down. my hand. Oh, you've go got ahead. yours. Okay, Kevin. <laughs> Leone said she uh, wants to go last, so uh, Kevin. Okay, okay. Uh, my question, you mentioned the 26 universities in South Africa not being totally aware of what each other are doing. How is it on an individual campus? So I'm thinking about the collective impact of university activities um, for community engagement and a measure of how well we're doing as institutions. It's something Eris has talked about with NSF program officers to kind of get a better handle of that. And, and the analogy is instead of a thousand little fires, what's the big forest fire that an institution can do in its region. Yes. Do you have comments on that, please? Yes, what we have, um, and this will come out also if we contribute to your summit um, next year. In Western Cape, for example, on, on the Western Cape campus, through our Deputy Vice Chancellor, Professor Vivian Levac, um, she's responsible for all academic um, programs on the campus, and then, of course, community engagement, the impact, the footprint of the university. And what she's done was because up until definitely six years ago, no university, not even us, as the University of the Western Cape, that we give any incentive or we had no um, policy plan as a university where we sort of told academics, you must do something. So this is why I showed you in the beginning, many, many years ago, um, our country legislation said, there are three legislated pillars for higher education. You must teach, you must do research, and you must do community engagement. And yet, um, as higher education colleagues, we used to resist it because we said there's no, there's no incentive in it, we don't know how to do it. There's no resources, et cetera, et cetera. And so some of the institutions, I've worked with several of them in South Africa. And so I would say out of the 24 public universities who get state um, funding, of those 24, definitely 14 has gone and tried to create awareness on campus because it had to start with things like what is community engagement? What are the principles of it? How can you do it? At the same time, since I've indicated six years ago with the National Research Foundation, where they said, let's put a grant um, out just for community engagement. That helped a little bit. Three years ago, they said it helped slightly, but what we're gonna do now is irrespective of what funds you apply for through the National Research Foundation, you must show. Um, what do you think your impact will be? How will you engage, et cetera? So it's gone better, but we are far from what I've read up on what happens in the States where you've gone through Carnegie Foundation where you even have classification. And besides that, like I've indicated, where a global study was done so long with um, via OECD to see uh, through a survey what policies are in place at universities? How do they do it? It's sort of, it's an ad hoc basis, which is why um, SAIS of the South African Higher Education Forum for Community Engagement started, is to say, let's just at least know about each other. 
Let's see how we can share on some campuses like UWC, where we have a very innovative um, uh, DVC. Uh, she's had in every faculty a person representing. Um, so what we call faculty is what you call departments. And so in our in what you call schools, we've got um, a representative that drives community engagement. And these reps have started to across campus communicate. So we're starting to get interdisciplinary collaboration so that we work integratively like the model that I showed you. So that marine studies also works with psychology and uh, arable land and whoever else. And then at the same time, some of those um, interdisciplinary groups have now started on the next level of saying, how do we go transdisciplinary? How do we come up with a new discipline, a transdiscipline in itself? But it's ad hoc. And it's for this reason that we are trying to through forums and through engagement um, to see how can we standardize it more because there was a lot of resistance actually in, in the beginning in South Africa from universities where they said, what is this? Um, we don't do the community thing, I mean, pure science, um, but it's improved quite a lot over I would say 14, 15 years. And this is why when I met with Susan, when I visited Missouri again, I think for the third or fourth time, um, where we started exchanging um, initiatives of where you are at, where we are at, and some things we are doing that you are not, but I think your, your awareness of we need to track it, we need to know about the footprint, the real impact of it, there we can learn a lot. And this is why I like this network of yours so much that I thought if we can just sit in and listen so often when you have meetings, etc., I log in just to listen because I can't contribute. It's country specific. Um, but that's where we are at in, in South Africa. But the scope is there. I think there's more openness and a much more keen um, sort of thought around let's collaborate, not just on campus, across universities and across regions and, and continents.